Hello everyone, how are you doing today? It is a really, really gloomy day here in Melbourne, um, but I'm still kind of liking this outdoor lighting for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to film this video out here. Um, okay, so me and my little sloth cup. I'm obsessed with it, it's so cute. Um, okay, so I wanna chat about something a little bit controversial when it comes to keeping houseplants open to some hot debates, but I wanna talk about environmental impacts of gardening. Um, different things that we do and use um, to take care of our plants that may negatively impact the environment. I know this might be a little bit controversial. Um, I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty. I'm just trying to raise awareness, um, start a discussion. Um, so you might already know about most of these things. If you do, then that's great. Maybe this is just a little reminder um, to try to make environmentally conscientious decisions if that interests you. Um, and hey, you might not even know about some of these things. So you might want to go off and do some research um, and see if you can start ma making, <laughs> see if you can start making um, better environmental decisions um, while simultaneously looking after your plants. Um, <clears throat> we all love plants, right? Um, it's why we look after them. So why not look after the plants that we have as well as look after plants in the wild and protect beautiful, diverse ecosystems that we have. Oh my God. This weather's crazy. I'm determined to film out here though. I really do enjoy this beautiful edge here for me <laughs> and the lighting. So let's try to suck it up. Okay, so a couple of first things I'm gonna mention is more in relation to growing plants outside and looking after your outdoor spaces. Weed killers, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, these things are no good in my opinion to have to use in your outdoor garden simply because they really disrupt your natural ecosystems. They can negatively impact beneficial insects, soil microbiology, um, and also they can run off into waterways and groundwater and pollute these food sources and habitat for a lot of native animals. So that's something to keep in mind. Whenever you can, try and use organic fertilizers, uh, manure, compost, making your own compost from food scraps and garden waste. Um, you might also want to make compost tea just by soaking banana peels or coffee grounds or a whole bunch of other stuff. You can get your Google and do some research and find out different things you can do in that regard. You can also use fish tank water. That's one that I love because I keep fish um, and I often just water my plants with my fish tank water. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do. Using chemicals in your house to look after your plants, that's not ideal, but if you're not using grey water, they're just going down the drain. There's a whole bunch of other chemicals that you put down your drain anyway. Um, I don't know enough about drainage to know how damaging or, or not that is to the environment so I'm not going to comment on it um, and I mean using pesticides indoors it's kind of contained so you know I'm going to turn a blind eye to that. So another thing is water consumption. It's important to know that growing plants requires a lot of water. If you live in a drier place you might have water restrictions in your area. I'm in Australia we've had a really wet year so now it's not such an issue but periodically Australia does go into drought and and so it's important to remember water is a resource that should be conserved to a degree. Um, right now it sounds ridiculous because it's about to rain here and we are li literally the whole country is flooding but it's important to remember that so if you can harvest rainwater do it your plants love rainwater anyway so that's going to be a positive thing but if not just try to use it wisely try not to waste it um, especially if you live in a dry area. This is again in relation to outdoor spaces if you live in a large area that borders a park or bushland or forest, just be mindful about invasive species, aggressive vines and bamboos and anything that shoots out runners. If they leave your property boundary, they can invade into parklands and bushlands and mess up the local ecosystems there. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. If your plants do leave your boundary into your neighbor's yard, potentially mess up things between you and your neighbor and you guys can sort that out. Um, but I'm more talking about if it, if your plants escape into native areas and disrupt native balanced ecosystems. Um, so try and avoid that. Try and be smart about the vines that you use. If you are going to use invasive vines, try to contain them. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do to contain different invasive plant species. Another issue is growing medium. Now this is a little bit controversial for some people um, because a lot of media, different media have pros and cons. So firstly, let's talk about peat moss. Now peat moss is found in peat swamps. Um, they usually have to drain the swamps and harvest 
peat moss. I'm sure some companies mitigate this process a little bit better than others. The whole process is very detrimental to the environment. That peat is not being created um, at the rate that it's been taken for growing and other things like that. There are a lot of benefits to having peat swamps. They are really good at capturing and storing carbon. They are very unique ecosystems that harbor some really cool plants and animals and I'm so passionate about these ecosystems. A lot of fish that I love um, are from these areas. I'm really against using peat just because of that reason and I would much prefer to use something that's a little bit more environmentally friendly. That's a personal choice. You guys might want to do some research into that and see if that's something that interests you. So then you've got your leca, um, you've got vermiculite, perlite and steel wool, rock, st rock wool. These are mined materials. Um, now, manufacturers of perlite say that we've only used to date about 1% of the Earth's perlite availability. That's very contested. I've found information that says perlite is really non-renewable and it's being depleted. And then I've also read other things that say, no, it's in abundance. Um, one thing I do know is that we only use a very small amount of the perlite obtained in horticulture. So it's not such a huge deal, but it is mined. Mining is always detrimental to the environment in terms of vermiculite and this rock steel wool. I don't use those things, so I don't really know too much about them. But they're processed in such a way that it is very, uses a lot of energy, releases a high amount of gas emissions. So if that's something you wanna watch out for, then maybe don't use those products. Lecker is also mined. Um, I know that it's a byproduct of other clay products that they mine. So that's how I justify it. As it's a byproduct, I feel less guilty about using it. Again, it's a very small amount that we use in horticulture as well. So mining is always bad for the environment. We use a lot of products that have been mined, so it's very hard to avoid that anyway. Some good environmentally friendly options you can use for growing medium um, or soilless medium, even in hydroponics are, so rice hulls are a really good option for adding some aeration and some chunk to your soils. Um, even in hydroponics, it's a really good option using coconut coir. Um, and coconut chips if you want something a little bit chunkier. Again, all byproducts of other, other industries. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is plant mileage. Um, in my opinion, it's not the biggest issue, but still worth a mention. Um, we all talk about eating food that's grown locally. It has less mileage um, and uses less energy to produce. We all buy things um, that are shipped around our country and internationally. We all go on holidays, but it's something to keep in mind. If you do have the option to buy something locally, then go ahead and do it. I would always choose to buy locally anyway because I like to support my local surrounds um, as opposed to buying internationally. But hey, if there's a plant that you want and it's 6,000 miles away and you just gotta have it, then go right ahead in my opinion. Okay, it's starting to rain, so I've got to wrap this thing up. If you like this video, go ahead, press the like button. Feel free to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Otherwise, feel free to drop me a line about anything that I mentioned today. And besides that, happy gardening. Bye.